as general as soon as we can. So we're not going to impose any other structure on X. We're just going to talk about it this way. So before we start talking about that, um, let me just recap a couple of properties of generating functions. So note that the coefficients of F are positive. And note if I plug in one, you get one. And we can actually take these two to be a definition of so for some reason, you're in a probability seminar and you don't care about random variables, but do care about polynomials. You just pretend to find out polynomials without any coefficients. And lastly, if x and y are independent, that means that the generating function of their sum is just going to be their product. So to even see why we might be able to say something about the zeros about the x, Let's do a totally extreme example first. So let's suppose that we have a real rate of generating function. OK, what can we do? We can take f of x, and we can factor it. So we have some constant out front, times z times all the roots. But let's note that we have positive coefficients here. So we must have that all the roots are negative. So maybe it's better to write it all as z plus lambda over 1 plus lambda. And you'll notice what we've done here is that we know when we plug in 1, we get 1. So now this has to be the correct normalization. But now if we observe z plus lambda over 1 plus lambda, is the generating function of a Bernoulli. With parameter of 1 over 1 plus lambda. So all of a sudden, if we know f of x is real rooted, right, then we know that we can factor the generating function as a product of the generating function of Bernoulli's. So this actually means that x is a sum of independent Bernoulli's. not necessarily identically distributed. So this is immediately going to give us a central limit theorem. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's best to credit this to Harper in 67. I've seen uh, people credit also to Levy, but I think that was unpublished. So this is sort of like a folklorist result, but also a result of Harper saying if f of x is real rooted, then we have an effective central limit theorem. So the probability of x minus its expectation over root variance is less than some number t minus the CD of the normal is less than or equal to constant over root variance. This may 
seem sort of like a tool example, but there are actually quite a few many things that are real unique. So Harper was interested in showing that the Stirling numbers of the second kind are normally distributed. And in fact, the generating function for them is going to be generated. So that's where this sort of came from originally for him. But also, more generally, or sort of a, a different example, the Halloween and Weave in 72 show that the generating function of matchings is really good. So in particular, if you give me any graph, and you're going to sample a matching uniformly at random, there's a subset of edges where I don't have anything of degree 2 or 1. The number of edges in that matching is going to have a real rate of generating function for any graph. Um, and of course, they stated it for monomer dimers because they're in the physics world. But indeed, this tells you the physical reason. So automatically, once you know the variance is large, you know you have a central limit here for the number of edges in a random matching for a graph. OK. So another example is a uniform spanning tree. I'm just going to say is real rooted. That's what I mean by that is if you give me any graph and you take a subset and then you take a uniform span tree of the bigger graph, the number of edges that lie in that subset is going to be real rooted. So this is a theorem of Burton and P. Mantle. There's sort of a long literature here, but I'll get a credit to the two of them. And this is in 93. So there is something sort of more general going on for both of these that hopefully we're going to get to talk about near the end, in that both of these um, are going to have a multivariate, like, zero-free region going on. And for a uniform spanning tree, you're going to be able to show that because the uniform spanning tree is actually determined for measure, something that P-mantle showed, which is why this is how I describe it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. OK. So for this first case, uh, Heilman and Lieb show that if you give me any graph and you choose a matching from it uniformly at random, then the number of edges in that matching, which is a random variable, is going to have a real rooted generating function. Similarly, if I take any spanning tree, OK, so if I take any graph, let me draw a quick example. Let's say you have some big graph G. You have a smaller graph H. If you take a uniform spanning tree of G and count the number of edges of that tree that lie in H, that random variable will also have real roots, or its generating function will. OK, so an example that doesn't have real roots but has very controlled roots is that of the using model. So Li and Yang in 52 show the partition function of the easing model has all roots with modulus 1. So if you give me any graph, and you look at the easing model on that graph, you get a partition function. And then if you set z equals, maybe I'll just write that. So under setting z equals e to the negative beta times the external field, then in this variable, z, all the roots are going to have modulus 1. OK. What's that? Oh, sorry. So this is where maybe the chain z equals e to the negative beta of u, where u is the parameter here. So beta, so we're looking at the easing model here. So we have an inverse temperature of beta, an external field of u, which is just going to be a constant. And if you set z equals e to the negative beta of u, under this variable z, 
you're going to hack up uh, all resetting modules. I don't understand what that is. Oh yeah, so maybe let me write it more explicitly. So we could write it, for instance, like this. Okay, yeah, so we're going to set our partition function. Partition function is a function of beta and h or mu. Ah, so now we think of beta as fixed, and look at this as a variable in z. So we're thinking of mu as the thing that varies. So sort of equivalently, we fix some beta, we have some mu or we have some h, whichever you prefer, and now we just evaluate z equals e to the negative beta mu. You get some polynomial. This polynomial always has roots with modulus 1. So I can actually, I can write down exactly what this it does a little bit. So maybe it's better to say, this will be a capital Z. Let's first write what it's going to be. We're going to take sigma, right, which is going to be a function from our uh, vertices to plus minus one. And you do e to the, let's say, negative beta times sigma i sigma j. And then let's say we have uh, some over beta sigma j. So now, I can take this, and I can just keep beta fixed, and I'll expand this thing right as a polynomial in this function. So in other words, this is just going to be sum over sigma. Then this first part is just going to stay the same. So we have our interaction term. And now over here, we just have z to the sum of sigma j. So I can think of this now as just some number. And this is going to be some real number that depends, of course, on beta. But for every beta you give me, this polynomial, uh, OK, so the way I've written it now, this thing is actually going to be a rough polynomial. But it's going to have all roots having modulus 1. Any questions? Yeah. Number what? I'm just assuming my underlying graph is fixed. So for any underlying graph, and you sum over all assignments of plus minus one to the edges, sorry, to the vertices, this Laurent polynomial will have roots only having modulus one. But you're doing finite both here. Yes, for every finite graph, this is true. It doesn't just have to be a subset of ZD, just any finite graph. Yeah. OK. Great. Um, yeah, I'm glad we went into that. So, a good question that you might ask is why would we and Yang, who are physics people, care about the zeros of this? And the point is that in a paper from the same year, which unfortunately is attributed to Yang and Lee, so Li Yang and Yang Li are two different papers from the same year, they showed that zeros of partition functions correspond in a way to phase transitions. So I'm not going to write anything super detailed here, but sort of the idea is a phase transition is when you have in the thermodynamic limit that your free energy is not analytic. So the free energy is related to the log of this thing. So if you take log of this and you want that to be analytic, that means we want z to be zero free somewhere. So what they actually showed is that the easing model only has a phase transition maybe I'll say at h, let's say with respect to h at h equals zero. So you can't have a phase transition through the easing model going from some positive external field to a bigger positive external field, only when you swap from positive to negative. Right, and sort of the way you might use something like this is you look at the free energy, which is log of this you know, normalized, and if you know that that thing is analytic everywhere except for the unit circle, that means in the limit you can get something that's analytic everywhere except the unit circle, but that was precisely when this mu here is equal to zero. Okay, any questions? Okay, 
So we're going to return to that setting uh, soon, but I just want to note a couple of other applications of zero free regions. So one thing is there's a connection between zero free regions and fast sampling. And this is the stuff of Barbanov. And I don't want to get super into detail here, but if, for instance, you have, let's say, a cluster expansion, if you know you're zero free, you can truncate your cluster expansion somewhere. That means you can approximate your partition function with very few things. So this actually gives you a way to connect algorithms to zero free regions. Something maybe a little bit fancier that you can think in terms of analytic number theory. Right, so there's a connection between approximating the prime counting function and a zero free region. And again, the connection there that I sort of want to just sort of express with these examples is in all those cases, you're examining the log of something. So for the prime number theorem, you look at the derivative of log of the zeta function. So you want that to be well behaved. So you want zeta to be zero free somewhere. That's where the zero free region comes into play. Okay. So perhaps let's get back to the general case we're describing over there. This is all sort of just to say that people have been proving facts about zero free regions. And sort of, we want to look at a context where we might have these zero free regions and without any other info be able to deduce a central theorem. Maybe in a case that's a little bit more robust than just having all your roots being real, like Harper's. It's okay. Maybe I'll go into this new book. Okay. Great. Okay, we're good. <laughs> so here's a theorem of Leibowitz Piddle, Ruel, and Sphere. This was published in 2016, archived in 2014. And it says, let x have generating function f sub x. And now, suppose f of x is 0 free in the ball of radius delta about 1. Then they get an effective central limit theorem that looks quite a bit like that. So the supremum over t of probability x minus its mean over root variance is less than equal to t minus the CDF at t is less than some constant depending on delta times n to the one third over root variance. In particular, one way you can think about this, right, is if we have delta is fixed and we have a sequence of these, or perhaps let me say here, x is in 0, 1 through n. So we can think about it as if n to the 1 third over the var root variance goes to 0, then you have a central limit here provided delta is fixed. So all of a sudden, rather than having to look at a case where all the roots are real, you can just control how far away the roots are from 1. And provided your variance is big enough with respect to degree, you get a central limit here. OK, any questions? OK, so I think this is a really great result. And I'm actually going to be able to sketch it for you in a way that I don't think it's going to be too crazy. Right, so let's think about why zero free regions are useful. If we take a log, then that means we're analytic. And analytic functions are the nicest things in the world. And we can approximate them very nicely. So let's do that. 
So what you can do is we can factor the characteristic function. The characteristic function is just your polynomial generate, sorry, evaluated e to the i of theta. Yeah, so this I can write as the product of, let's say, e to the i of theta minus lambda over 1 minus lambda. Now I can take log of both sides and Taylor expand. What we end up with, you get log of f of x e to the i theta is going to end up looking like negative i expected value x theta. I'm sorry, i expected value x theta minus theta squared over 2 times the variance. Plus, since we're uniformly bounded away from 1, we can just Taylor expand each of these and we'll be all okay. So something on the border of n, because we have n things. And now, you just get a central limit theorem immediately once you divide by sigma. So if I normalize, and I set, let's say, t equals theta over sigma, what we end up with as our error term is n over sigma cubed. So if that goes to zero, you end up with exactly the generating function, sorry, the uh, cumulative generating function. This tells you that you are normal. So if I do this, we end up with, let's just write log of f tilde, e to the i theta, is negative theta squared over 2 plus big O n over c. So when this goes to 0, you just end up with the, your uh, characteristic function being exactly that. Okay. So one thing I sort of want to point out about this, I think this is a really beautiful result. Um, the thing that is sort of interesting is we actually never use the fact that f has positive coefficients. So that means, in fact, if we take a very generous definition of what a central limit theorem is, and we say that a central limit theorem is when whatever the characteristic function is looks like that of a normal, this would imply a central limit theorem for just general polynomials, provided you have exactly this condition here. So the question now is if we make use of the fact that f has positive coefficients, how far can we get? Okay. So here's a question. If we make use of the fact that f has positive coefficients, how much can you gain? So uh, upon reading this paper by uh, Leibowitz, Pindlerell, and Spear, Mantle conjecture basically that you can replace the right hand side with something that doesn't depend on degree. So in this context, a CLT should follow. From just variance going to infinity. So I think this is a very bold conjecture. Um, it seems if you look at this proof, once again, that there's sort of this really hefty dependence on the degree being killed by the variance in some type of way. Um, and indeed, uh, Robin came very close to the truth, but the first theorem I want to tell you which I guess I'm going to write 18 slash 19, archived from 18, published 19 by me and Julian, that this is not true. So in particular, we provide an example of a family of random variables whose roots all have radius 2. 
um, and for which you don't have a central limit theorem, even though the variance goes to a theorem. But we are able to get very close to what Robin was asking for. So this is, again, me and Julian. In a paper from August, we showed that if f of x has no roots in the ball of radius delta at 1, then you get a central limit theorem. And now your right hand side is a constant log n over delta times sigma. Where here x is in 0 from n, and let's say sigma squared is the variance. So this isn't exactly the case that you can replace it with just variance going to infinity. You just need your standard deviation to be bigger than log n. So this constant here is totally universal. It's like 3 to a big power. And I just want to note this is sharp in everything. I guess but C, of course. Yeah. So in fact, you can have delta shrinking, sigma shrinking, whatever you want, just as long as this thing is small enough, you get such. OK. So, in the context that P Mantle is thinking about, which again I'm hoping to return to later, um, he was thinking about these multivariate zero free regions. And he wanted to prove a multivariate central limit theorem. So, one way you would prove a multivariate limit theorem is by projecting down in all possible ways to one dimension. So, when he projected down, he noticed that he was zero free in a certain region, and that region was actually a sector. Um, but he thought all that mattered was zero freeness around one. So we proved, at the same time as proving this, if we have no roots with, let's say, argument less than gamma, then you get the same theorem, but with no dependence on n. So maybe I'll write this up here. Well, this is the one that makes noise, I think. So if you're zero free, if you're zero free in any sector like this, you get a central. So I don't have any questions on these. OK, so I want to, at some point, mention a couple of ideas that go into proving this. But I think it might be worth mentioning just what's going on in this multivariate setting, which is sort of where a lot of this was inspired from. So let's say we have a, ver a random variable in d dimensions. So if this is a random variable and it has generating function, which is now a multivariate object, and this guy is non-vanishing, in the strict upper half plane to the D, we say x is strongly really. So I know this may seem like a weird definition if you've never seen it before. There's sort of a really nice story about this. Um, 
I'd love to get into more detail for it. But let me just say now, strong Rayleigh is a notion of negative dependence. So there are many examples of these sorts of things. Maybe a prototypical one is let's say you take a bunch of independent Bernoullis and you condition on their sum to equal something like k, for any k. The idea is if I assume one of them is bigger, that pushes down all the other ones together. And that's going to be strongly rare. Similarly, if you look at a uniform spanning tree where you assign a variable to each edge, that generating function is strongly rarely. Because if you assume that a few of them are positive, you end up with a bunch of other ones being negative. So I'm not going to get too deep into it, but this also generalizes determinantal measures. So the story of this also for negative dependence, let me just write down a couple of names. The important names here really are Orsia, Brandon, and Ligon. I'm just going to say around 2010, because there are several papers by substance of these authors. But the way this paper happened, which I think is very fascinating, is around 2000, uh, P. Mantle wrote a paper basically saying, like, what should a notion of negative dependence be? So one thing you could ask is just for negative correlations. But then that sort of begs the question of what should the relationship be for three of them? And he outlines a bunch of properties that it should have. And then in a paper in 2012, where Sia Brandon and Liggett presented this definition and just knocked off all the checklists of like what Robin wanted to happen. So these things satisfy everything you would want, sort of a theory of negative dependence to satisfy. Another thing to notice is that this is just a generalization of real rootedness. If you just do this in one variable and you ask to be zero free in the upper half plane, then we know you're also zero free in the lower half plane. So that means all your roots are real. So as a corollary to our theorem, a pretty immediate corollary, we get essential limit theorem. I'm just going to write a central limit theorem for strong real, provided the operator norm of the covariance matrix is big. And this uh, is sort of how I came to this stuff. Robin Kimmel is my advisor, and he sort of asked me this type of question. questions on any of the statements that I've written down? Yeah. So if I take this one, however, yeah. you said this means that uh, you're real rooting, so it means that I'm the sum of independent rooting? Yes. So it's kind of surprising, you know, if you have only one rubber and you say oh, it's negatively dependent, I would assume it's no constraint, but in fact, ah, okay. it's, it's forcing that it's a sum of value. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point. So, okay, what I mean by negatively dependent is that the coordinates are negatively dependent. As in, we're thinking about having like a vector of d variables that are joint in a way, and the dependence between them is negative. Right, so right. if you only have so, one, yeah, okay. then we're not really thinking about uh, negative dependence because there's only one guy. Right, but, but still, yeah. but still look, if I read the definition, it, mm -hmm. it, it actually produces a strong constraint. Yes, so it does. Again, though, it is like a generalization of determinantal in a way. So any determinantal process that you might have is also going to be strongly real. But in particular, if you think about just Bernoulli's, where you have them independent, they're negatively dependent, but only because the dependence is basically zero. So they're also sort of like positively dependent, but that's because they're just not dependent at all. Does that sort of answer? I just mean, if I take a, a uniform run of our it's was zero one, it's not uh, negatively dependent, which I can't find, because it's just one variable. Well, if you take something uniformly between 0 and 1, its generating function won't be uh, real rooted. I guess, are you talking continuously? Okay, right. OK, yeah, yeah. OK, sure. So you want to think about this as talking about like a joint distribution, like a measure on, let's say, the hypercube or something is a place you want to be thinking about this. OK, so maybe I'll mention a couple of things about how 
we might prove some type of limit theorem like this. So sort of again, we have to figure out a good way to make use of the fact that our polynomial has positive coefficients. So one thing to note This has positive coefficients. Is going to imply by the triangle inequality is that if I look at some point r e v i theta, this modulus is going to be less than f of x of r. So another way to say this. So sort of a lot of the point for trying to make use of uh, positivity is to try to take this condition here and sort of use it to generate more and more positivity conditions and show control of our uh, characteristic function. So let me maybe show an example for what the first step is. So we're going to set u of z to be log of our generating function. So this is our harmonic potential. Sorry, logarithmic potential. And note, this guy being 0, 3, and let's say a sector, is going to mean that this is harmonic in a sector. So let's remember, our goal is to show a central limit here. So really our goal is to show that u of e to the i theta, let's say, is approximately i theta times the mean minus negative a half sigma squared theta squared plus something small. So if I ignore this term, and cancel it out, our goal is to show that we look like negative 1 half sigma squared theta squared. So maybe a first step is to show that you're actually decreasing the theta. So u of r e to the theta is decreasing with respect to theta small. Okay. So I definitely don't want to get too in the weeds of proving things, but I am just going to demonstrate this proof. So you can actually just do it with a picture. Let's say this is our real axis, and I take two points here and here, and imagine they're on an arc. We want to show that if I evaluate at this point, I'm bigger than if I evaluate at this point. So let's remember, u is harmonic, and for probabilists like me, the definition of a harmonic function is I can evaluate it by plugging in Brownian motion starting here, running it till I hit the boundary, and taking the expectation. So, how can we do this? We want u of r e to the i theta 1 to be bigger than u of r e to the i theta 2. So what we can do, okay, I'll just draw it over here. We can start a Brownian motion here, and a Brownian motion here, and I can couple them. And they'll either hit and go here. So my difference will be 0 in this case. Or they won't couple. And 
And I'll evaluate this minus this, which I just told you is positive. So in this case, we would get u r e v i theta 1 minus u r e v i theta 2 is 0 in this case. And here it's positive. Say that again, what is it positive? Ah, because we're evaluating u of r and u of something away from the real axis. And the triangle inequality tells us that's not negative. Just because if I take a polynomial with positive coefficients and I just plug in any z, and I take the modulus of it, it's less than if I just bring the modulus so inside. Why, why would the Brownian motion start from the low point exist here and not there? Yeah. Ah, if it does exit up there, Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to couple these two Brownian motions. So that way, it will either exit down here. So I'm going to do it by reflecting it, let's say, around this axis here. And now, they're going to combine and kill each other. Or they're going to separate, and I get something positive. So just by looking at Brownian motion, we're able to say, OK, great, this thing is decreasing. So since we wanted to show that we basically look like a quadratic with respect to theta, or negative or quadratic, showing we're decreasing is sort of the first step. Okay, so I'm not going to get too into that much more for the rest of the proof, but now we have a harmonic function, and it's decreasing. So now if I look at certain differences of it, I'm going to get something that's har uh, harmonic and non-negative. So in particular, let's say u r e to the i theta minus u r e to the i theta plus phi is positive and harmonic. If I just fix phi small and fixed. And you have a positive harmonic function, we know it doesn't vary too much. So I'm just going to say this will give us cumulative control. So the tail of, let's just say, the Taylor extension of u r e v i theta is small. And then the last bit, which is sort of the last thing I'm going to be able to mention, is we need to say if eventually accumulants are small, but you actually are close to a standard normal. So let me just write down a theorem I like quite a bit from 1939 by Martin Kavitz, which is a name I will never be able to pronounce correctly, which just says, if I give you a random variable, and if it's characteristic function, is e to a polynomial, then in fact, x is a normal random variable. So in other words, the only way to be e to a polynomial is if the polynomial is of degree 2. So OK. So this is a theorem from the 30s. Um, and what we needed to do is to prove an effective version. So in particular, if log of this is close to a polynomial, that implies x is close to normal. Okay, so I think that's all I have for you guys. Um, thank you. So log to be close to a polynomial in a small region. Yeah, so, so for your result, it would be uh, 
So you, you can remove the constraint that it's an integer value. Oh, yeah, maybe. Great. I'm really glad you asked that. So I can remove that completely for this, just provided your characteristic function is entire and doesn't grow too fast. Um, yeah. Similarly, over here, you can remove this constraint and replace log n basically with the maximum in the like, small disk, but it becomes a much more unwieldy statement. Of course, yeah, in that case, instead of talking about generating functions, you want to talk about like a moment generating function, but it's obviously equivalent. You have good examples? So we have some examples. Yeah, so one example, which is uh, primarily due to Leibowitz Phil realm sphere, is um, remember we had this example of matchings. So let's say instead you take a random graph, and instead of asking the degrees to all be at most one, you ask them to be at most four. Then this is going to avoid a sector. So uh, a sector. Is four special here? Four is special in a way that's kind of hilarious in that if the max degree of your underlying graph grows, the sector shrinks, and the techniques fail completely miserably for five. Yeah. So maybe a thing that's worth mentioning is the way that a lot of people prove zero-free regions is with these so-called asana ruel contractions. So the way it works is you have a graph, and you have a way of choosing something from it, and you have a way of relating what happens if you just remove one vertex. So sort of they have this iterative process of removing a single vertex, and uh, yeah, using only this machinery, it falls apart completely when you look at five. Yeah, which is, yeah, it's a fascinating situation.